I've been doing FL Digi for eight or ten years now. At the very beginning, I was too cheap to buy a signal light. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what I did was I took the, uh, I would type when what I needed to say into the input buffer, take the microphone from the rig, hold it over the keyboard, and then tell it to transmit. And uh, it worked out fine. I had a little microphone plugged into the laptop, and I just laid that on the desktop in front of the uh, in front of the rig, and I worked fine that way for a couple of years. And um, eventually, I found that the, the real limitation of doing that is the frequency response of the speakers and the microphone. I couldn't get to the higher speed uh, modes and the fancy modes because they just didn't work that way. So anyhow, then I bought a signal link and I hooked it up with a switch to where I could switch back and forth between uh, my Balfang and my ICOM. And that worked pretty well for a few years. And then I went out and bought a IC7300. Uh, it's got a built-in sound card and it's just been heaven ever since. Uh, let's see. Um, oh yes. I do some other digital programs like um, FT8, RMS Express, and some encrypted stuff for Mars. But um, FL Digi is my favorite. And so here are some of the things that I've learned over time. This is where you go to download. You, you just did that this morning. And uh, what you'll probably need is FL Digi and FL Message. Get my little laser pointer here. You'll need these two at least. Uh, if you have difficulty uh, talking to your rig, you might want to get FL Rig as well. FL AMP is something I don't think we're going to have time to get into today, but that's uh, for file transfer. It's so you can guarantee 100% uh, transfer of your files. Uh, one thing, once you do get FL Digi installed, go to the help menu and open a beginner's guide to FL Digi. It's very well written and um, should give you a good refresher to uh, most everything in the first hour of this show here. Uh, once you've mastered that, you should be able to get on the air and talk digitally with the speed and dexterity of a teenager on a cell phone. When you first bring it up, it wants you to identify yourself. Um, and it's a good idea to put in all the information, like um, your antenna, and your station locator. That way when you're, uh, if you elect to report to PSK reporter or something like this, it knows who you are and where you are. Your locator data is also used for automatically computing the azimuth to your remote station. So. The next thing you need to do is configure your sound card. Most of us are on Windows, and so use port audio. And then select your the codec that you're going to be talking to. Linux users will use pulse audio or OSS. So that's that's the that's the basis of getting started. The next thing we're going to do is um, talk to the rig. Now, FL rig is used with FL Digi as its client. It's a separate program, and it controls nearly 100% of over 60 different types of rigs. Uh, this is one of the things that they recommend. I find it's much easier to use RigCat. Now, RigCat was um, designed for and built into FL Digi. 
And the way it works is it uses a bunch of uh, command and response definitions that are built into uh, an XML file. And you can go out to SourceForge and find all sorts of these defined files. Uh, well, for that we need a, a serial or USB to our transceiver? Yeah. Not just audio, right? Right. Yeah, if, if, you've got, uh, if you've got control of your rig. So if we if we use uh, ham radio deluxe or something to control our rig, then we've already got the hardware and yeah. uh, this uh, rig cat will just talk through that interface. Generally, yeah. No. Uh, every every setup's a little different, so. Uh, so what happens if you don't use rig cat? I mean, we just there, there's there's lots of different ways to uh, talk to and control your transceiver. You can just turn the knob on your radio. You yeah, know, that's it. That's what, that's the way we do it. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, that works too. Uh, it's just that FL Digi won't be able to tell the radio what uh, frequency to go to. Yeah. When, once you get it all set up, uh, your rig and your FL Digi controls will just mirror each other. And you can change the rig and you'll see it change on your computer, or you can change it on the computer and your rig will follow it. Like normal, okay. Yeah. So it's, it's really sweet when you get it all hooked up and working together. Uh, there's other ways to trigger your push to talk, and you can do hardware only with a um, wired line from a serial port or a parallel port. You can tell FL Digi to put your push to talk as a tone on the right channel, and then you can build a little audio circuit that listens for that tone and triggers a relay or a transistor to key your rate. Or if you're running this from a uh, Raspberry Pi, you can have a GPIO uh, pin that will do that. Now, rig cat commands are defined in an XML file, and uh, FL Digi will look for that file in the rigs directory for all files that end in XML. Then you select the one you want to use here. So if you have two or three different types of rigs, all you have to do is go in here and select the rig you're going to be working <coughs> with, and everything is fine. So it's very easy. You select the rig you're going to want to use, set up your communications, and tell it that you want to use it for doing your PTT. So it's bim bada boom and with the 7300, it was just that easy to get all set up. A lot of the other newer rigs, too, are, are that way. The speed there, is that set by FL Digi or by the type of rig you have, the 19200? Uh, you can set that at both places. Is it? You, you, you can set it in your rig. If your rig is configurable like the new ones are, otherwise, uh, uh, you set this to match whatever your rig can do. Now, setting the correct hardware, the operating system, and the FL Digi's receive audio levels, it's not really difficult, but it's the one procedure that is most often done incorrectly. Notice here that the signal processing path and the display path are two separate paths. Simply said, the way to adjust the audio is to set this path for about zero dB and then use the front panel control down here for setting your display for about optimum. There's two schools of thought. One says to set this at about zero dB and then change this for the best display. The other school of thought says set this for about zero and then bring this up for a good display. My most favorite approach, my new approach, 
is to tune in that Canadian time service, CHU Canada. We listened to that a little bit this morning. And uh, you set the front panel control here to about zero dB on the front panel. And then you set this to where the little level indicator on the front, the little diamond that I'll show you in a minute, to where that blinks black during periods of no tone. So if you have your gain set too high, that little diamond will be green all the time, meaning that you're always decoding even when there's no signal there. So just to the left of the waterfall display, you'll see a little button down here that says WF, that's waterfall. You push it a time or two and you'll get this signal trace. That's just essentially a, uh, an oscilloscope view of whatever signal is coming in. And you want it to be not too high because that will be clipping and you'll get distortion or too low because you'll miss stuff. You want to set it to be about in the middle. Now, if you're, um, let's see, yeah. If your sound card or your codec is functioning correctly, there should be no signal offset. It should be right in the middle. And you want it to be between these two gray lines, up here and down here. Now the little diamond I talked about before, this is where you see it, down on the lower right hand part of your FLDG screen. And uh, when you're listening to the CHU, it should blink black when there's periods of no tone. And that'll get you set up just about right. Now that you've got your receive level set, we can go on to excite your transmitter. And the way to do that is you set your windows level to near zero, set your waterfall to a thousand hertz, set your transmit level attenuator, that's down on the bottom near that little green diamond, to minus three dBs, turn off speech compression, because we don't want to distort our signal, and then activate the tune button. This will put out a one kilohertz tone at the maximum amplitude that FL Digi can generate. And then you slowly bring up your Windows level control until your ALC indicator just begins to indicate. If it's a meter, it might just start moving. If it's a light, it might just start blinking. But then go back just a little bit. Now you are transmitting at the maximum output power without distortion. You can use any level below this and be assured that your output level will be clean. If your sideband filter is mechanical or crystal, you may want to do this at two or three places across the audio band because those filters are notoriously unlinear. There's a lot of variations. You can use this uh, attenuator here to make small adjustments in your output power. Most every mode needs to be quite linear. Unlike voice where you can tolerate a little distortion for that little extra power, the digital modes will be much worse off. Even with the ALC not activating, you should keep your power to 50% or less because most of these modes are like 100% modulation with no breaks for your vitals to cool down. But that's really okay because your digital modes get out so well and they're so efficient that 30 or 40 watts, you can work just a hell of a lot of DX with that. Now, when you first start up your FL Digi, you'll see a screen that looks something like this. And these are the major areas of your screen. There's your logging area, what we, 
what's called the channels view. There's your receive pane, your transmit pane, all your macro buttons, and the waterfall. We'll hit on each one of these now. First is the um, receive pane. Everything you receive comes here. If your squelch is too high, you won't get anything. If it's too low, you'll get garbage. You can select text from here and paste it into other things. And just clicking on words here will do interesting things. We'll show a demo of this in a minute. If it looks like a call sign, that call sign will be put up in the uh, call area in your QSO block. The next word you click on will go to the name field. The third word will go to a QTH block. And the fourth word you click on will go to your state block. When you're working contests and such, this order of things may be different because you've got a different uh, logging area selected. It might go to exchange and serial number, something like that. So the next thing is the transmit buffer. Anything you type will be sent. You can drag and drop a text file into this area and it will just expand just as if you spent 20 minutes typing. If you are faster than the mode you are sending, you can type ahead. So you don't have to worry to slow down to just sending as you type. I recommend trying to finish a complete thought or sentence before starting to transmit. I think it's a little bit better to have some dead air than to just uh, have the machine transmitting a whole bunch of null characters while you're typing slowly. Uh, and then, piece of etiquette, always add a blank line or two before your message and end with a, another blank line or two and a control R, or a, this caret R, which what that does is it returns FL Digi to the receive mode. And now let's see. An 80 word per minute mode is wasted if you only type at 10 or 20 and you <coughs> force that fast mode to follow your slower typing. There are three ways to get around this. One is by taking a speed typing course or change to a Dvorak keyboard. Uh, two, you could use a slower mode that will use less bandwidth as well. And three, finish your typing uh, before you transmit. This will become very apparent at VHF and UHF when you're using really fast modes. You couldn't type anywhere near 600 words a minute. So. Uh, there is one mode that I'll touch on a little bit later that forces you into this because it doesn't start transmitting until you hit the carriage return. So you type a bunch of stuff and then you hit enter, then it starts transmitting. I think that's cool. Uh, the channels view, that, that white area that nobody knows what to do with. In modes such as PSK and RIDI, you can have lots of signals in your audio passband at the same time. They will all be at a slightly different frequency. And this window will show them and decode them all in a list. You can set it to highlight any uh, line that says CQ or your call sign. And you could take this window and as a separate window, not in FL Digi, you could make it a separate window and put it on a separate screen. 
If you've got uh, two screens on your computer, you might want to have one um, dedicated for this. Uh, I recommend, unless you're doing a lot of PSK31 or RIDI contests, to get rid of the channel view. You can do this by dragging its edge all the way to the left, or better yet, just turn it off in the view menu. <coughs> And that's where you go to get the signal browser. Here's a view of the um, signal browser, the, uh, this window, during a RIDI contest. Notice the little CQ down here? Uh, whatever you type in down here, it will look for and highlight so I've got CQ here, and it highlighted these three signals that had CQ in them. You could put your call here. Uh, for your computer geeks, it'll also take any um, regular expression that you want to put in here. This is this little slider. That's its own squelch control. So you can set the level that these signals obtain. One interesting thing, when you click on a line, it will move you to it. Say this guy down here near a thousand hertz, if I wanted to talk to him, I click on this line and it would move my uh, center down to him and you're ready to talk. There's a configuration page for this where you can set uh, some of its parameters, like its delay time, and I've got this one set to show the audio frequency. You can set the display to be just a channel number or the uh, actual rig frequency. Okay. Um, up in the logging area, there's a whole lot of little boxes up here. The main one that you're going to see is the dial frequency of the rig. With, like I said before, with your rig set up properly, these controls will follow the rig and vice versa. Changing one will change the other. Now you can use the mouse wheel on any digit, up or down. You can type in uh, a frequency direct, just highlight the field and type in a frequency. Uh, also, you can use the up, down, left, right arrows with and without the shift key to change these, um, these digits here. There's the audio frequency filter. Um, there's the mode of my rig. All digital modes use upper sideband, by the way. Um, and what that means is your dial frequency plus your waterfall offset, which for me is about 1500 hertz, that gives you something called the center of information, and that is put up here in the log. So when you log that contact, you know the exact frequency that he was centered on. said if you click on a word and it looks like a call sign, it'll go up there to your call block. The next word you click on, come on, where's my mouse? Come on, mouse. There we go. Um, we'll go to the name field. The third word you click on will go to the QTH field. And finally, to the state field. Here, I've highlighted a bunch of text. You can copy and paste that. Um, I took that and put it into the notes field. It's also interesting to know that 
the current Zulu time is always displayed. So that when you enter a log entry, uh, that's the time that you push the log button. Uh, other interesting things about this um, log area, if you've configured a database such as QRZ, you punch this little globe button, this little globe button here, and that will look up the call in QRZ. You can even tell FL Digi to open a browser to QRZ with that guy's call selected. So you can see what he says about himself. Um, the little broom button right here is punch that and it'll wipe out uh, everything and you can start over. Whether you use QRZ or you typed it in yourself, punching this little button down here, arrow into the book, will log the entry into your log book. Um, QRZ used to return a whole bunch of information, like uh, the azimuth and your um, grid coordinates, in fact, your city and state. But now all it does is seems to return just your country. Your call, your first name, and country is all it seems to uh, respond now. I don't know, maybe that's because some people complained about privacy issues or something, but uh, it used to be really nice. You get everything. Now you have to look it up yourself. Hey, Paul, does it have its own log file or does it interface with your log software, logging software? Uh, it, yes, to both. Okay. It, it's got its own, but it also will interface to Logbook of the World and EQSL and some others. Uh, the built-in Logbook is pretty nice. You can change it and such, and if you're running a contest, it'll turn that into a Cabrillo file for you. Um, what else have we got here? When you click on a call, FL Digi looks it up in your log and will add some color to it. This uh, is the color I have selected for a duplicate, which means I've worked it recently. I wait a little bit longer, I click on the same <coughs> call again, and it comes up in a different color, meaning that, hey, maybe the contest is over or whatever um, duration I picked in the configuration file has expired. Contesting has its own set of colors and conditions for duplicates, by the way. Uh, log formats. Uh, there are a bunch of logging, uh, I mean contests built into FL Digi. Um, here's one for the uh, New York State QSO party, an in-state uh, member of the New York QSO party. Notice that there's a sent and a received serial number and an exchange. Here's the one for field day. Notice class and section right down there. So when you're clicking on words in your receive pane, it'll go call, operator, class, section. Here's something very few people know about. It's called a pick list. It's a handy lookup table for your favorite nets, hangout spots, certain modes and bands. It's often used uh, for other setups. For example, on Friday at 1300, I like to go to 15770 kilohertz AM and listen to the shortwave radiogram. Anyhow, um, what you do is you click on this book that has the little bookmark tab on there to open it. Pick a line that you want, and then that little green arrow right there, you click on that, and it'll take all those settings, put them into FL Digi, and set your rig up. So it's, it's really easy. It'll change your modes. Um, your center frequency and so forth. Uh, 
to make this list, you tune in whatever you want to listen to and hit the plus button and it'll save all those rig settings, uh, all your FL Digi settings, it'll save it into this list. It'll make a new entry for you and then you can add your own text on the end of it to do the description. Or you can edit it, of course, you can hit the minus sign to delete that line or you can delete the whole bunch of people. Now we get them down to the next busiest field, it's the waterfall controls. Uh, this waterfall control is where you would click to bring up the, um, uh, what do I call it, signal trace. You can change the width of the display. You can expand it up to four times around the center. There's your speed, offset. Now this offset is the center of, um, of the range that you're looking at. So that's, I'm at an offset of 1500. You can nudge it a little bit one way or another by 1 hertz or 10 hertz by using these buttons. There's a transmit offset lock and a reverse. And there's your pico threshold, that's your squelch. Um, when it's below the green level, you're decoding. This button down here is essentially sub-modes. That uh, is all the variations of the mode that you have picked. Here I've got Thor 22 chosen. So if I click there, I'll see uh, all the other Thor modes that are available. Some modes, like this one, actually tell you what the signal to noise ratio is. And another interesting thing this mode does is uh, rather than just send out null characters when you don't have anything to type, it'll go to this little uh, string that you add in there someplace and it'll send characters from there. A lot of people will put in their call sign. I put in, you know, a little sentence about uh, Fairport. Here is your level attenuator. We talked about that earlier. There's your uh, little signal level diamond. There you can turn your squelch off. Oh, this little block over here, that is the digiscope. You can turn that on or off. And what it does is it gives you different views of the decoded signal that's handy when you're looking at um, Ridi, for example, helps you tune in better. You can show uh, data flowing through your display? decoding filters. What? Where do you click to get that display in the right? Uh, it's in your view menu. You can show it from your view menu. When we get and. Next is the uh, macro buttons. Did you find that? It puts it up by left hand side. You can move it around. Yeah, you can de you can have a detached window, or you can actually show it in your waterfall. Is it in the waterfall menu? Item? Yeah, view yeah. waterfall dock scope. Yeah. yeah. There's a uh, there's another mode where you can calibrate your um, uh, sound card to WWV. In that mode, you want to take that scope and stretch it out long and tall. 
we will not get into that just yet, but maybe another time. Anyhow, um, for most people, these are just storage places for text. But it can do a lot more than that. It can fill in the call sign of the guy that you're talking to, his location, any information about him. Uh, it can add, add a serial number. Like you, if you were working a contest, your macros can fill out a serial number. Um, and give the current time. There are 48 different macros, and you can select which group of four which, which group of 12 that you're looking at. Remind me later to show you where to select those. Uh, I was going to ask you, what do you select them? Yeah. When we get to the demos, it'll, it'll, it'll be easy to show. Uh, the default and the way it comes is with one row showing just above the waterfall. I like to use two rows showing up at the top near the uh, logging window. And you can have a lot of stuff in these macros. I was having a nice rag chew with this one guy one night. He told me all about his garden, his place up at the lake, his dog, and so on. A couple of nights later, I heard the same guy talking to somebody else. <clears throat> he was saying the same things, but in a different order. And including an identical typo in the same place. <laughs> so I knew that he had his most probable conversation topics all thought out in advance. It can be fun to make your own macros. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. Here, this slide is a little busy and you're not supposed to really be able to read it, but this is um, the flowchart that I use for running the New York uh, NBAMS net. Each one of these blue boxes is a macro button. For example, to do the call up, I hit Shift F1, and then I do a uh, call to a geographic area like Eastern New York would be shift F2. If anybody answers me back, I will, in my um, transmit buffer, I will say, I have. I'll do that by saying F1. Then I'll click on his call sign, and then I'll hit F2. And I'll keep doing that. Click on his call sign, F2. Click on a guy's call sign, hit F2, until there's no more signing in. Then I'll say F3. Are there any others? Shift F3 and go back and do the loop all over again. So you can run this net without doing any typing. Most guys do that. Um, editing your own macros can be fun. The way you do it is you right click on a macro button and it brings up this little editor. And you pick one of the things from this list, hit the left arrow, and it puts it over where your cursor is. A challenge for you guys would be to find the eight different ways that you can display time. Okay, now getting into all the different modems, all the different modes. There's a lot of them, but it's difficult to just know which one to pick for what you want to do. What's good for short range may not be good for DX. It's hard. It's not impossible, but it's hard just to sit on some frequency and hope to hear a particular mode coming through. If you've got an SDR or a pan adapter or something like this, you can hang out in the neighborhood where nets usually are, and you can oftentimes find 
a signal that looks like a digital signal and then go to it. Um, there's only a few modes that I know of that have hangouts and places where you would go just to look for signals. I can go there and talk to this guy in Puerto Rico almost any time. Um, start with your nets and then usually before or after a net pipe, there's people that you can write you with. Now we'll get into some of the modes themselves. Domino EX is a whole family of multiple frequency shift key modes. The interesting thing about this is that they have a constant amplitude and a constant phase. This means that there's very low <coughs> side bands on the, on the signals. And because there's no amplitude changing, you don't really need uh, a real linear transmitter. So a lot of those requirements are relaxed when you're using Domino. This is what uh, Domino 11 sounds like. Oops, if I get the right mouse. In mode, Domino 11 was um, about 80 words a minute. It's the default or the normal calling mode. It was designed for NVIS work, such as 80 meters at night. The modes below 11 are double space, and that makes them a little bit better for low signal work. This uh, Domino EX8 is about uh, 7.8 baud and 58 words a minute. And then Domino 22, it's about 160 words a minute. It's got good rejection of multipath and Doppler, <coughs> and it's immune to a lot of frequency drift. That's what that. That's why it didn't change screens. There we go. And the next mode is Thor. It's essentially built on Domino EX. And what they've done to Thor is they've made error correction built in all the time. It's got most of the same characteristics. Uh, an interesting feature is that uh, lowercase characters are sent faster because it's only one tone burst instead of two. This is Thor 11. Did you hear that uh, double ramp? tones at the very beginning. That's a very distinctive part of Thor modes. It's cleaning out the decoding filters as the transmission begins. Thor 8 is, uh, again, double spaced, a little bit better for low signal work. It sounds like this. And then Thor 22 will sound like this. It's a lot faster. Uh, let's see. It's the double rising tone sequence at the beginning of each is used to flush the decoders, and it gives you a visual and an audio clue to the mode that's being used. Uh, Thor also can pass images and has avatars. We'll see that in the demo. 
it is used by most of the regional nets for our check-in loads. <coughs> Olivia is a big family. They all have very good sensitivity. Um, it doesn't really require a, a, a absolutely linear transmitter because there's no amplitude modulation going on. It works good on poor HF paths and it's very good for fixed SCADs. This was uh, Olivia 8500 was the standard uh, for regional check-ins for many years. It sounds like this. It sounds a little bit lower because they're using um, 800 hertz as the center for this. Most everybody now uses 1500 hertz as the center. well on HF paths. There are some modes of Olivia, some of the narrow, slower modes are very good for um, <coughs> high signal to noise. <coughs> MFSK is another big family, um, but it doesn't tolerate very much mistuning. You've got to be within 5 or 10 hertz. Whereas in Olivia and such, you can be more than 100 hertz off. Uh, most of the nets will switch to MFSK32 for passing traffic. This is what 31 sounds like. Characteristics, it's got good sensitivity and it works good for long path. And most regional nets use this for traffic passing. <coughs> PSK, digital phase modulation with two states is called BPSK for bipolar or binary. PSK31 is one of the earliest digital modes, and it sounds like this. It's very narrow, and you can get dozens of those in one audio passband. If you have four states, it's called quadrature PSK eight different states, it's called 8PSK. These can be very fast. Uh, use them on uh, VHF, UHF, you can get up to around 4,000 words a minute with some of those. In general, the narrow bands work quite well on single hop paths, but because it's phase changing, uh, sometimes when you go off the ionosphere, they don't work so well. There are many species of PSK. It's a very well-known waveform. It's used as the basis for a lot of other modes. There are multi-carrier versions. There are robust versions. And there are multi-carrier versions of those robust versions. There's quad versions and eight PSK versions. So I would suggest that anybody that's really into VHF, UHF, to compare 
some of these modes against the new digital radios, fusion and whatever else there is out there, and see which ones really carry the best data. I think using an analog repeater and some of these modes, you can get data transfer really, really good. Um, let's see. What are the multi-carrier versions? Let's say that you have a transmitter sending a PSK64 signal centered around some offset. There's nothing in the laws or regulations that says you can't simultaneously run another transmitter on a slightly different frequency, sending different information, <coughs> also using PSK64. Well, there's also nothing in the rules and regs to prevent you from using one transmitter to do the same thing, to modulate those two carriers simultaneously. And this is exactly what happens in the multi-carrier modes. For example, the uh, Gettysburg Address using PSK-125 takes a minute and a quarter. With 12X carriers going at the same time of PSK-125, it takes about six and a half seconds. Uh, the multi-carrier versions of PSK Robust uh, work very well. A 2500 hertz bandwidth though, a 2X PSK100R will do the Gettysburg Address in about 10 seconds with full forward error correction. Now, I don't know if you can see that or not, but um, this is Winlink. They use eight PSK, eight carriers. You can see these eight carriers here in a bandwidth of about two kilohertz. They also use some amplitude modulation. So each of those eight phases has two amplitudes. So they get 16 QAM. There's a lot of data bits in one little tone. And it has uh, forward error correction. So this PSK modes are used as a basis for a lot of different things. MT63, I don't know anybody that uses it, but it's been around forever. Uh, it's quite robust but it's a bandwidth hog. This is what MT63-500 sounds like. <coughs> and 1,000. But uh, there's an interleave associated with, with that. You can pick three speeds and two different interleaves. And once you start playing with those long interleaves, you'll see why turnaround time is such a drag. <coughs> Throb. This is uh, kind of a cute mode. Uh, you'll know it when you hear it. It uses either nine or 11 tones sent two at a time, kind of like DTMF on your telephone dial. Uh, it uses um, raised cosines to turn the tones on and off. And so it would sound a little bit like this. This is throb two. Throb four. X with 11 tones. Now, I play around with this uh, prior to the weekend net sometimes. People will know it's me if they hear that. Um, it's essentially a curiosity mode. But it is reasonably sensitive and it it's out there. Uh, 
FSQ stands for Fast Simple QSO. This is the mode that I told you about that re kind of forces you to uh, finish a sentence before you hit the transmit button because it's the enter key, the carriage return, that starts the transmitter. Uh, this one mode could be the sole topic for another two hour course. Uh, it was invented by Murray Greenman and Con Wasleaf, both of New Zealand, and they have produced a program of their own to really make use of all of these features. Um, mailboxes, selective calling, relaying. I could call somebody in Connecticut relaying through somebody in Massachusetts. I can call the Massachusetts station and tell him, pass this message on to somebody that he can hear that I can't. And I can do that without him even being there. Cool mode, it's fun. Uh, what to listen to? Okay. Some of the nets, you can go to this one on Saturday mornings. Uh, Pennsylvania net meets on Sunday mornings. A little later on Sunday morning, the New York Races net meets. They will pass a short radiogram by voice, and then uh, when they're done with that, they will go over to the digital portion of the band and send that using three different modes. Olivia, Thor, and MFSK32. So they get practice using all three of those modes. Uh, the New Jersey net meets a little bit later on Sundays. There's the US East net. I've got handouts here, by the way, to uh, show all where places. all these uh, places are and a bunch more. Ohio Net's a big one. Yeah. Um, Tuesday night. Right. Around 7 30 or 8 o'clock. Right. And they use Valley O and Valley O. Olivia. Olivia. Yeah, Olivia. Uh, 800. Yeah. Their center's 1,000. Uh, shortwave radiogram is rather interesting. They send a lot of pictures, uh, and it's on international shortwave. Standard forms, a lot of CSV files, custom forms. When you first launch FL message, you'll get this. And uh, hams should always pick this communicator expert. The simple user, user interface is designed for the non-communicator, such as a served agency. It provides easy access to create, edit, and view messages that a ham brought to them. To configure FL message, you put in your call, decide how you want to have time displayed, and how you want to have your file naming conventions set up. And then you have to configure FL Digi to work with it. You've got to tell it uh, that you want to transfer any incoming messages directly to FL Message. And this is where it finds it. So that's really all you've got to do. Um, some people like to open their messages in a browser as well as in FL message. If you're working with uh, a served agency a lot, you might want to 
have both FL Message and the browser come open. I think I do that for printing. I don't think I can print right from FL Message. So that's, it print from the browser. That's exactly why. Um, some of the forms that you get uh, can be very complex, including pictures. Here's one form that you would, uh, an example of using pictures. The person filling out the form might say, oh, it looks roughly like this, so he punches that button. It puts in the number two someplace and creates the form when you submit it. So that just helps the guy that's taking the data. Now, the expert user interface, the hams, have access to all the forms. And generally, it will sync into whatever you have your FL Digi or FL Digi set up for for your modes. Once you fill out a form, you save it in your file menu, and then you <coughs> auto send. That'll send it. This is the standard uh, radiogram form. And let's see. Some modes cannot use FL message because they have a reduced character set such as uh, uppercase only and so be, check out that your mode that you have here uh, works with FL message. There are a lot of built-in forms if you've ever played around with it at all you'll see a bunch of ICS a bunch of hospital specific ICS forms The Red Cross has a lot of forms, and you can go to the Red Cross and get a whole bunch of special custom forms for the Red Cross. I've got those on a uh, thumb drive here if anybody wants them. Amron, all the preppers and such out in Montana and such, they've got a set of forms. I don't know if you can read this here. Uh, let's see. Designed as a tool to aid soldiers in reporting observed enemy activity, this can be adapted to report criminal activity, invading military forces, or forces of an oppressive regime. Okay. Uh, there are two different types of radiograms. You can have plain text messages. Or you can have CSV forms. Here's a typical uh, state training message uh, from Racy's group. It's transmitted in voice using NTS procedures where they spell out commonly misunderstood words. Uh, if you've been in the traffic system, you'll know ARL messages. These are built into FLB2. And here's an example of an ARL message. There's a bunch of these. In this particular one, I filled out with filling in these two blanks with these two pieces of information. And it makes the body of your message for you like that. CSV files, any spreadsheet file that uh, you convert and save as a CSV file can be sent. Lists, rosters, etc. Um, the way it works is you import the CSV file and it makes this internal file with a C2S extension on it. FL, or FL message knows how to handle this type of file. That same file in Excel. Now, custom forms. Many people have built custom forms over the years. Uh, 
There's a bunch from Red Cross and Amron, like I showed before. Uh, we did a hospital status form here about four or five years ago. Here is a daily shelter report. This was developed by the folks in Pennsylvania for, uh, for their needs. In one of their exercises, this was in the comments. I don't know if you can read it. But the thing I liked about it was <laughs> Big board opponents, yeah. This is our the top of our hospital field status report. The top of the second page. Uh, the bright colors are added to help the hospital workers make correct assessments and thus help avoid errors in times of high stress. Okay, like John mentioned here, the developers of FL Digi did not include a print function. Instead, they convert the forms to HTML and let you send it to a local browser on your computer to figure it all out. So to print a form as received, you open the file menu and select view the form as HTML delivery. Then use your browser to print the page. <coughs> You see this small blue box on the upper right hand corner? Uh, that's where you can drag and drop any FL message into that spot and it will open it and display it, regardless of the type it is. Um, there's a lot to FL message. If you're working with a served agency or something like this, it's probably uh, good idea to become very familiar with it. Maybe even install the simple version on your agency's uh, computers. Okay. There's a bunch of different ways you can tell your transmitter to start talking. There's a TR button on the uh, front panel. You can say control T, and while it's transmitting, you can hit control R, and that will put, put this little caret R at the end of your input buffer. Good thing to remember to always do that. Uh, if your keyboard has a pause or a break key on there, that will toggle your transmission. Uh, if you're transmitting and you see your finals uh, melting down, you can hit the escape key. That'll stop things quickly. Now, the tab key, the tab moves your insertion point back and forth between the next character to be transmitted and the end of the buffer. In receive mode, this means between the beginning and the end of the text buffer. Uh, while transmitting, this essentially stops the next character, whatever it is, from being sent. And so that essentially pauses the transmission. It keeps your transmitter on, but it just stops that character from being sent. Hitting the tab key again moves it to the end of the buffer and so it continues transmission. Um, there are transmit and receive and toggle buttons in your menus, so you can add those to any of your macro functions. Or you can simply right click on the transmit pane and say transmit. There's a new feature in the newest version of FL Digi that allows you to add noise and distortion to your outgoing signal. And uh, it's good if you want to test. Now we're going to do a, uh, get into the show and tell part of this. Um, 
we're going to do a brief tour of an audio setup. That's this thing you see here. Then we're going to observe a net and observe some foreign text and an image. And then do all this other stuff. I don't think we're going to have time to do the FLAMP though. If we were transmitting over the air, there'd be no problem. If we wanted to transmit over cables in a room, uh, there would be a lot of problem because you'd need uh, directional couplers, dummy loads, all that sort of stuff, and you'd still only be able to talk to a, a couple stations. So what we do instead is this. Expanding that, we've got this audio mixer here. With this configuration, a number of operators can sit together in a room like this, just as it would be over the air. If two stations talk at the same time, their signals will conflict with each other, and nobody will be able to understand what's being said. And the mixer can also make one station appear to have weak signals, like a distant radio station. So, um, that's what we're going to do. If I can get my mouse back, there we are. Like I said, Windows updated me last night and <coughs> there we go. <laughs> so now we're going to uh, uh, get into the demo portion. You guys can see what's being received on these uh, other. What mode? Uh, it'll set it for you if you've got your receive ID turned on. RX ID at the top. Thank <laughs> you. 
said three? Mm -hmm. Or 22. Or 22. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing any yellow in your uh, waterfall? Getting a good audio signal? Or what? Are you seeing audio in the waterfall? You see it? it looks like you're getting there? Yeah. Yeah. No. This is a half hour radio program, and you can see how the um, ionosphere gets pretty bad, gets pretty noisy toward the end. The first 15 seconds of this, I want you to watch the um, uh, waterfall down here. Let's see, are we in normal speed? Shortwave radiogram, we transmit digital text and images on an analog shortwave broadcast transmitter. For more information about our project, visit swradiogram.net. That's swradiogram.net. On today's program, should the Persian language of Afghanistan be called Dari or Farsi? Whatever, we transmit a sample of text in that language. And North Korea installs electric power meters. First, the program preview at MFSK 32. That's MFSK 32.
double mixers for your sound quiz. Well, that, that's your output. You're looking for your microphone and what? Four minutes. Zero hour. Forty-four minutes. Let's. CHU Canada, temps universel coordonné, 0 heures, 45 minutes, 0 hours, 45 minutes. It looks like you're getting a very good signal in there. in there by changing the range. So it looks like you're decoding. You're seeing, you're seeing tones. Yeah. I've noticed when this is going, I've always got a lot, of, a lot of stuff happening over here. I don't know if it's internal noise to this. this it, might, it might be. Yep, there is none. I'm just picking it up from the internal mic. Have you seen the, seen the this thing? The volume control your microphone. Turn up the microphone. Zero hours, 47 minutes. Something inside the laptop. Very possible. Okay. I did it in a frantic state, so I don't remember how I got that. I, 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 I can show there's several ways. I've always been this one. Right foot. 